Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the rescheduled start and happy Alice Day. I hope some of you are dressed up uh, or will at least have a cup of tea or a jam tart today in honour of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Um, my name is Nicolette Jones. I review the children's books for the Sunday Times and uh, I am glad to welcome you to this event hosted by the Wonderland that is the Story Museum in Oxford. I'm sorry we're not here to, to see it in its grand uh, refurbished glory, um, but we opted for keeping everyone safe instead. I'm more than delighted to be able to introduce to you the great Chris Riddell, OBE, former Children's Laureate, three times Kate Greenaway Medal winner, and political cartoonist for The Observer. This year is the 200th birthday of John Tenniel, the first uh, published illustrator of Alice in Wonderland, and also chief political cartoonist of Punch magazine for 50 years. Like Chris, he satirized current affairs and illustrated for children. And he's been, I believe, a hero of Chris's since childhood. Now Chris has followed in his eminent footsteps by illustrating Alice himself. The book will be published in October, but this is your chance for a preview, as well as your chance to see the miracle that is Chris drawing live. But tell me first, Chris, about your memories of seeing Tenniel's illustrations and the effect that they had on you. Well, my uh, my first encounter with uh, with John Tenniel's work was um, in uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and it was the wonderful um, picture just at the beginning, um, almost like a frontispiece, I think, um, of the white rabbit looking at his pocket watch, um, and the the something about that image i think that, that caught my imagination as a, a a young child and i've always thought it was probably to do with the way in which uh, tenniel manages to imbue his uh, uh, creations with, with with sort of character and there's real character in every aspect of his depiction of the white rabbit from the, the folds of the, the the sleeve to the um the, the posture the slight paunch the rabbit has the way it's standing in exactly the way you would imagine a, a real rabbit would stand and more than anything the, the look in the eye um and i must have drawn that you know copied out uh, this this illustration many times in an attempt to analyze just how Tenniel managed to make this this um, uh, creation so lifelike. And Nicolette, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to change over to my um, document camera. And so you will see my pencil there in all its glory. And uh, I will just move this over as we're talking. The, the great challenge I found was to actually um, sort of create my own rabbit. And of course, I didn't want to um, sort of uh, make it a um, uh, sort of obviously tenure rabbit, but in fact, it had to be in some senses. So, so here, here he is with his pocket watch, about to disappear into uh, into the rabbit hole here. Um, okay. And again, you know, this this sort of attempt to to make this rabbit as as realistic as possible. It's a pale imitation of the great master tenure. Um, but I had to, in many senses, just put that out of my mind as I approached this this uh, project, and just trying to imagine what uh, Alice in Wonderland would look like, almost as a contemporary picture book in some sense. Well, I was going to I say that there there are two challenges, particular challenges for you. One is that you're constantly reacting to Tenniel. You have to take that original and think. You know, it's a it's a kind of response all the time to Tenniel, isn't it? Because you know that those images are going to be familiar in people's heads. But you're also trying to do something which is more up to date and more modern. So how did that change things, the modernity of it? Well, I tried not to be self consciously modern, um, but I attempted to sort of you know approach it from my point of view. And I think um, one of the one of the things you see this rather lovely ribbon. Uh, I'm going to start drawing in a minute, but but I just thought I'd do a little yeah. bit of sort of book promotion here. Um, my uh, my hair is a boxing hair. You, you can tell he's had a career in the ring. Um, and my hat, the mad hatter, is female. It's well, yes, and I I rather like this this notion of sort of the Victorian doctor who would join the British army 
and, uh, and, and spend a career as an eminent, you know, sort of uh, medical person. And then, you know, on his deathbed reveal that he was a, a woman. Um, uh, and I like that as, as, as a theme. Also that Shakespearean notion of, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, the principal uh, dressing up in men's clothing and, and passing off as a, as a as a sort of man through through the comedy. So I thought my Hatter, which I think is Teniel, one of Teniel's most iconic um, characters. I thought it was um, it would be fun to actually sort of uh, make him um, a cross dresser in in a sense. And here he is with with the rabbit. So I alternated between color and and black and white. Um, so there are many, many sort of colour sort of plates and lots and lots of black and white um, throughout. Um, and I tried in the sense just... That can... oh. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say that another thing you can see from that illustration that you did was to... Uh, I mean, there are two options, aren't there, with Alice? You can either go with the blonde Alice of Tenniel and uh, Disney, or you can go back, as a lot of illustrators have chosen to do, to go back to something that looks like the original portrait of... Alice Liddell, who was the, the child to whom the story was originally told and on whom Alice was based. Um, one or two illustrators have done this before. Anthony Brown did it before, I think. Uh, um, uh, Emma Chichester Clark has a dark haired Alice. Why did you choose this option? Why did you go for her? Um, I, I went down that, that option, Nicolette, because um, I uh, absolutely loved um, Dodson's illustration uh his photography um and the, the the beautiful sort of photographs of of alice so this is alice as a, a lockdown sketcher uh, um and um i i love those photographs because there's a sort of wonderful sort of intimacy in his photographs of alice and her sisters uh, um, and uh, you could almost imagine them as the original um sort of listeners to to the story the dodson would have would have uh, uh, told you know sort of on 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 that picnic, and so I felt it was right to bring you know the real Alice, the Alice Little, into the heart of this uh, this this wonderful sort of classic uh, children's story. And a lot of the sort of illustrating Alice was about, in a sense, I, I felt it it felt like sort of children's literature archaeology in some sense. I felt I was sort of you know going back and reimagining something that is so familiar to us in some ways. Um, uh, and I like the idea. Sorry, I like the idea of Alice at the heart of of this uh, of this story, the real Alice. And here uh, they are. One of the things that yes, actually hearing the story on the day on the afternoon on the river where it originated. Lovely. That's right. Um, I'm just being a little bit sleepy, you know, sort of waiting for this. So this is based on one of the, 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 the lovely photographs um, in, the, in the book. Um, one of the other changes that you made was you made the Queen of Hearts young. Uh, what prompted that? Um, I think she's a very glamorous figure. Um, and, and my playing cards, I think, are rather sort of, you know, fashionable. Uh, playing cards. Um, I wanted to get away from that rather grim sort of um, Tudor um, idea of the playing cards. And so my my sort of Queen of Hearts is a bit of a fashion plate, I've got to say. Um, and so um, uh, here, here is the, the croquet. There she is. I mean, she's still formidable, I think, uh, Nicolette, but at the same time, she, she does rather enjoy um, sort of dressing up. The king is, is, is a little bit more diminutive. And again, as or almost a sort of um, uh, um, Albert figure to the Queen of Hearts, Victoria. But uh, but my Queen of Hearts is very much a young Victoria, I, I, I would say. Um, and again, this is just, this is my Duchess as well, who's, who's a little bit sort of less atlax than, than the original. And again, it was just a way to try and reimagine this 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 um, much loved uh, story in in a slightly different way. We've got we always have Tenniel's illustrations, um, so in a sense we have that, and those are the ones I love um, tremendously. I also love the Arthur Rackham's version, um, but then you have Toby Anson doing beautiful things. You've got Helen Oxenbury doing yes. a wonderful updated. Um, Alice. So I didn't need to do any of those. I just needed to do my own. So in a sense, this is my own response to uh, to these these much loved characters. 
And you drew some things that Tenniel didn't. You took some details of the story, I noticed, um, and invented something entirely new. So that, for instance, I, I don't believe there's a kangaroo or an upside down Australian in Tenniel's version, but there, there is in yours. There was an opportunity to draw a kangaroo quite spuriously, and I, I just started to design through the looking glass. And I was hugely um, delighted to, um, to get to the banquet scene um, at the end of Looking Glass, where Alice is flanked by the red and white queen. And this extraordinary banquet is taking place that actually features two very, very sort of badly behaved um, kangaroos who are actually sort of jumping around in the source boats uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, getting up to mischief. So I thought, well, it's obviously kangaroos must play an important part in Lewis Carroll's sort of uh, um, imaginative life. So I got, a, I got a chance to actually sort of put some kangaroos in for real. Um, but I think in, in Wonderland, Alice is imagining falling through the center of the earth and emerging in, uh, in Australia. So I was playing with that, you know, upside down notion uh, which Alice herself uh, talks about. And of course, if you could mention Australia, I'm a cartoonist, part of me sort of works in this rather cliched way. Um, I thought, Australia, I've got to draw a kangaroo. So, uh, and there are several characters, for instance, people tend to forget that in the original story, there's a pigeon, um, because what people remember is that the, the are the characters that were illustrated and Tenniel never um, illustrated the, the pigeon. Um, but you did. Uh, so you, in a way, changed the emphasis of the text by taking some of these details and putting putting characters in that we might now remember that we tended to forget about because we've never seen them. I suppose that's interesting, yes. Um, I, I think the pigeon is wonderful. It, it, it's rather sort of shocked and, and annoyed that, that Alice, um, with, who is experimenting, um, uh, Nicolette, I don't advise... You know, younger readers or, or older readers to do this, but she's experimenting with mushrooms um, and changing her shape uh, from time to time. And, and she does intrude on this pigeon's world. Um, and there's this wonderful sort of um, scene where, where Alice is, um, uh, has taken a mushroom and has become incredibly elongated and uh, finds herself peering into, into the branches of a tree and disturbing this completely innocent pigeon. Who uh, who mistakes her for a serpent, and uh, and it's a, a wonderfully surreal and strange scene. And I just thought, well, look, I have three hundred and twenty pages to explore. Um, I've got to explore Serpentine Alice. I think that that's got to be a, a thing to do. And uh, I enjoyed drawing the pigeon as well. Um, I don't know about you, Nicolette, but during lockdown, um, birds have sort of become very prominent for all of us, and. Um, I've got a couple of extremely noisy pigeons that uh, that sort of uh, tend to sort of sit on my my sort of um, on the eaves of my studio and coo away, and I imagine they they might be Wonderland pigeons. There are some illustrations. By the time you'd added these extras, including, I, I, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury, I don't think was illustrated by Tenniel. There, there are various characters you picked up. There's a guinea pig in yours that I don't believe, and a bat and a crocodile. Lots of, uh, lots of creatures that I don't think were in the original. But it also means that there are some pictures that uh, he included that you didn't. Presumably you squeezed out some of the alternatives. Can you think of anything that Tenniel drew that you decided not to have another go at? I'm not sure that I can actually, Nicolette. I mean, maybe, maybe you can you can tell I me. I thought maybe the uh, the man made of white paper. Did you uh, have I did I miss that illustration? You did miss that, and do you know why? Why? Um, because it's in Looking Glass. Ah, oh, so it is. So it is. Oh, <laughs> He's in the carriage. <laughs> if I'd known the books better, I'd all my by the man, uh, made a yeah. paper because um, I've got a choice here. I can either draw him uh, in, in a, as a self-portrait, um, and I can be the man of paper as the illustrator. But the other thing I'm thinking of is is possibly drawing the man of paper as um, as Tenniel, and my homage to Tenniel. Yes. And Tenniel has got the. I'm, I'm drawing now an Anglo-Saxon archbishop, because when you talk about Wonderland, these are the sort of strange avenues you go down, um, and. Um, the 
Anglo-Saxon Archbishop is the subject of a um, of a rather dry um, lecture given by a mouse. And the reason the subject is as dry and dusty as, as it is, you know, the describing of Anglo-Saxon archbishops is that the mouse is attempting to get everyone um, who has been soaked in Alice's tears, the great pool of tears, um, he's trying to help them get dry. And the way to do that is obviously to sit through a very dry lecture about uh, archbishops, as we all know. So there's a wonderful sort of strange <laughs> comic logic in, in everything that, that Carol does um, that is just great fun to, to illustrate. Um, in the um, looking glass, the, uh, the man of paper is in fact a barely disguised um, Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, which is rather wonderful paper, to yeah. see. <laughs> yes, white papers from the from the House of Commons. Yes. Um, so I now I, thought that uh, I might I even have to say sort of I'm quite to astonished as I'm sure other viewers are. Another man of paper. Oh, yes. Well, I think like this you. really could be uh, another man of paper, couldn't it? Uh, so maybe in in the spirit oh, of the original sort of Disraeli. I know who that is. <laughs> Yes, there we go. He, he, he wants he um, to behave responsibly, Nicolette. I hope you all you, you've been behaving responsibly at the pub today. I'm staying alert. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yes, strangely, I didn't find my way there. Um, uh, I have to say, I find this absolutely astonishing what you are conjuring so at such astonishing speed. Uh, the one question I was going to ask you was: um, Was there anything that was a particular challenge? But I, watching you, I, I'm beginning to believe that you can do anything. Um, perhaps none of it was difficult. Were there any things <laughs> where you thought, "I don't know how to, I don't know how to, how to uh, tackle this"? Well, I think there was this sort of um, sense of the uh, correct way to sort of hold a uh, hold a piglet, um, you know, because uh, <laughs> the the sort of piglet uh, is the Duchess's baby, and and uh, Carol is very very particular about how this piglet is actually held um, in um, Alice's arms as it sort of transforms itself into a piglet, and and Alice holds it um, by the ear, and also holds it by one of its trotters. So I had to sort of configure some. It, it felt in a way like Wonderland yoga. Um, you know, <laughs> trying to sort of get into the piglet holding position that somehow would would sort of make make sense. Um, and so that that was quite an interesting uh, challenge. Um, but I like a good challenge illustratively. Yeah. If, if someone tells you um, there is a sort of uh, uh, something going on, as an illustrator, I feel it's it, it's beholden on me to attempt to draw it, however impossible. I think to well, paraphrase the challenges. Yes, uh, but to paraphrase the um, uh, Red Queen in Looking Glass, um, I like to draw at least six impossible things before breakfast. Well, we have invited the public to offer you some in impossible things to draw in uh, lockdown land as opposed to Wonderland. Um, I, I wonder if you'd uh, like to hear some of the things that people suggested. I, I would love to, Nicolette, and as you do that, I'll just do a few, as they say on Blue Peter, that I prepared earlier. Uh, these yes. are some lovely suggestions that came along on Facebook. And so the first one um, I rather enjoyed is the notion of a, um, a hatter delivery service, because, of course, everything is being, uh, is being sort of delivered. I'm, I'm wondering whether we could call this um, Hatteru. I mean, that, that, that would be a trade. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to trademark that. Um, yeah. That could be something. That was from uh, that was from Sophie Hiscock at the Story Museum, who wanted, uh, who imagined that the Knave of Hearts might set up a new takeaway jam tart business. Yes, we've, we've got the takeaway jam tart. Everything seems to be takeaway these these days, Nicolette. I um, um but uh, but it is a sort of um, you know quite literally taking away the jam tarts. It's a good cover for him, I think. Yes. Um, and the other thing I rather enjoyed. Was, was the Cheshire Cat signage suggestion, you know, which 
I think um, the Cheshire Cat could be perfect if they bring back the coronavirus briefings, um, you know, <laughs> all the disembodied things telling us contradictory things could, Some people could really go this way. Back, yeah. back on track. And, and, and here is um, here's a self-isolating mushroom. I think we all <laughs> turned into uh, caterpillars in a sense. And what, what we're, I hope we're, we're, we're waiting for, this is, uh, this is my attempt to do a sort of Boris Johnson um, sort of uh, speech. I hope we're all waiting to turn into uh, butterflies as soon as the lockdown is over. I think we're in our pupil stage at the moment where we want to get out out of that chrysalis and uh, and become butterflies. Yes, always a danger that butterflies are then rather short lived. So uh, yes, I should, I'm not sure we should uh, we should rush into this. Um, but uh, yes, that that uh, uh, one suggestion was from Janet, who said perhaps Alice feeling vulnerable and scared and not quite sure what to do, but she doesn't show her fears and comforts to her friends. Is that a challenge? That sounds a complicated thing to be able to draw. It is, but but in in, in a way, I mean, Alice. This is the character of Alice, which I think um, is is um, really comes through in in the book. She she is um, uh, inquiring and interested, and she attempts at all times to try and sort of make make this strange world that is is so dreamlike. She she tries to sort of impose. Um, a, a sort of logic, a sort of child's logic um, on, on the world. And I think there is a sort of, she's, she's sort of brave and inquiring. And sometimes, you know, Alice can be sort of seen as a little bit bossy, a little bit of a sort of prim uh, Victorian madam in, in a way. And I don't think she is. I think she is, um, she's wonderful and inquiring and innocent in, in, in a way and, uh, and sees the sort of humour in a lot of things, so I think during lockdown, certainly, um, I think Alice would be would be inquiring and inventive, and she would sort of um, she would see the the sort of um, ludicrous side of some of the things we have to do. She would be very good at hand washing. I think um, uh, she would uh, she would enjoy takeaways certainly, but I think what she would do more than anything else is she would lose herself in, I think, a sort of, you know, the wonderful sort of worlds open to all of us, uh, which are the worlds we find in books. And this has been a sort of wonderful time, I think, for, for all of us to sort of escape through uh, through the medium of a book into well, of course they would our own wonderland, I would say. Her, but her books would have to have pictures or indeed conversations. Because as we know, um, she yes, said, what is the yes, point of the book? And if, if she couldn't find that, then there's always, you know, a Zoom call, um, <laughs> which, which, you know, you know could, could, could work well, certainly in Wonderland. Um, lots and lots of talking heads could, could sort of come in and, and, and help out. You have suggested that she's rather fearless. And, of course, that's one of the things that makes uh, Alice in Wonderland appeal I think to us that one of one of the I wonder what you think the lasting attraction of Tenniel's illustrations is it's strange for something for a political cartoonist of the you know mid 19th century to still be our favorite Alice illustrator why do you think is he did it work so well and why do we still care about those images I, I think because um, because Tenniel was so good at um, visualising this extraordinary world in a very sort of direct way, the way that he he peopled his political cartoons. You know, he um, you know if you um, if you decide there's going to be a lion and a unicorn having a battle, Tenniel will show that. You know, yeah. in in its anatomical correctness. Um, and I think there's something wonderfully engaging about that. He's got a very clear and direct style, um, uh, and everything he draws has got a character. Um, and I think the only we we were sort of touching on um, on sort of um, the the one thing that almost Tenniel didn't feel he 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 could draw, and 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 that was um, this extraordinary sort of wasp in a wig. Yes, in uh, in Alice in Alice Through the Looking Glass, he persuaded Lewis Carroll to emit an entire chapter 
because he said uh, it contained a, a wasp in a wig, which he which he said was um, uh, altogether beyond the the appliances of art. Um, but now you are demonstrating that in fact it isn't. This is the no, it isn't. I think you can just about imagine you know, uh, a, a wasp in a wig, except it would be, possibly it wouldn't be a wig, possibly it would be a very unconvincing sort of comb over. Um, and, uh, yes. and it would be this one of these <laughs> ludicrous, ludicrous wasps. That, um, you know what that I think? I think that's a chapter worth, I think it's a chapter worth missing out. I think Tony was right. Now, now I see your wasp in its, in its comb over. <laughs> I think we can do without. There we go. What's been a wig? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give you some, a few more of the choices that other people came up with. Um, uh, somebody said that this is Paul Masters said that he would love to see a socially distanced caucus race. I thought also uh, a socially distanced Mad Hatter's Tea Party, either of those things. The Tea Party being a bit more like the kind of thing that some of us are actually doing, sitting outside and socialising at a distance. Well, of course. Um, and, you know, uh, I think Carol and, and, and Tenya with him sort of invented the socially distanced um, uh, Tea Party because, of course, you know, there is um, the, the table is set for many, many people. Um, imagine, you know, your local pub, I think, uh, they're all having sort of the Hatter's Tea Party as we speak, I think, because there'll be people sort of sitting at one end of this enormous table and other people sitting at the other end, you know. So in a, in a sense, we're, we're all in Wonderland now um, whenever we sort of go out into sort of, you know, we're, we're all having sort of... Uh, mad tea parties. Um, I think the caucus race is, is interesting. And again, you know, it, it's that wonderful sort of sense of the, um, of everyone sort of running everywhere, sort of with, uh, with no sort of particular sort of end in mind, um, which, which seems, I think, to sort of, you know, sum up, I think, the, uh, the US election very, very well. Um, there is a sort of awful lot of <laughs> rushing around to no avail um, in the caucus race. I'm not sure how socially distanced anything will be with uh, with Donald Trump, but uh, but we've got that. And, and I think that's one of the sort of things that I rather sort of love about uh, the world of Wonderland and Looking Glass is that they've given us um, so many sort of um, terms that we we now use, you know, sort of, you know, the caucus race is one and the, the, the mad tea party, but you've, um, you've got these lovely sort of um, aphorisms that come from the, uh, the chess pieces about believing sort of um, impossible things and, uh, you know, running extremely fast to stay in the same place. And, uh, you know, the, these, I think the, these books have, have entered the public consciousness, I think, in an extraordinary way. And it's been fantastic to be able to um, to sort of go back and, and, and uncover some of the sort of hidden gems. Um, my uh, my particular sort of favourite at the moment is is a sort of rather rather depressed um, gnat that that I'm going to sort of be uh, be drawing for um, for Looking Glass um, because already um, Nicolette, I've embarked on the sort of um, the, the sort of crazy sort of task of illustrating looking glass before wonderland has actually come out so uh, so there's a, a, a wonderful sort of um, nat who um who talks to uh, to alice um in the train carriage and he he feels like a sort of um uh, a sort of slightly failed um cartoonist in a way because he's um He's always he's terribly keen for um, for Alice to tell uh, tell jokes. Um, he wants to sort of feed the jokes through to to Alice. Um, she can't actually see him because he's so small until he sort of uh, turns up on a leaf um, uh, after they've left the carriage. Um, but he's forever sort of you know quipping and saying, "Why don't you say this? Why don't you say that?" as a joke. Um, so there are sort of it speaks to me as a as a cartoonist. One of the things that you've demonstrated already with your drawings is that uh, contemporary ideas can fit into uh, 
the the mad nonsense scenarios of Alice in Wonderland. Um, and if you put uh, a recognisable character, a Boris Johnson or a Donald Trump, into those images, uh, it seems to say something meaningful about them. Um, and I suppose what one of the, you talked about the way Tenniel uh, illustrates things quite literally, but uh, at the same time, the text is a kind of a combination, a kind of madness. Do you think that political cartoons are often like that? They're a combination of a uh, a literal idea, um, you know, some factual event that's actually happening, and a kind of mad eccentricity. You have to make them, you have to m put meaning into mad situations. And so, actually, Alice in Wonderland serves the, that purpose perfect, perfectly, because it allows you to take the eccentric extremely. and put the real into it. I, I think that's extremely well put, actually, Nicolette. And if you could write that down and send it to me as an email, I'm going to quote you um, whenever this subject comes up, because I think you've, you've, you've put it absolutely beautifully. Um, I um, I actually sometimes sort of joke that, that um, the only good thing about um, the last uh, sort of little while, and I, I would say sort of um, the last, certainly the last few months, but, but maybe even the last few years, um, is that it's been an extremely good time to be a political cartoonist because, um, you know, one never, never runs out of material. Um, I, there are times, and during this lockdown, I've wished that um, I had run out of material and, and everything was fine and there was absolutely nothing for me to draw uh, in The Observer on Sunday. Uh, but in fact, you know, it just keeps on whenever you think we've reached some sort of point of, of ultimate sort of uh, uh, craziness, something else happens. Um, and I think, you know, what I've done to, um, uh, I'm just going to sort of reach over, um, what I've done to uh, try and um, stop myself in the mornings as the Queen, Lovely queen of, of Hearts. hearts. Glamorous version. Uh, it's true that there's a logic to the Queen of Hearts being glamorous because it suggests that she's the uh, the object of love or or somehow somehow associated with. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, yes. Melania. I, I mean, see. I, she's <laughs> completely inscrutable. Um, <laughs> but to stop myself, sort of um, shouting at the radio in the mornings, Nicolette. I've I've come across you know this thing, and, and sketchbooks have often got me out of uh, problems. So. Uh, to stop me getting too cross in the mornings, I've started um, a series called Five Years, a Sketchbook of Political Drawings. And each morning I put on the Today programme, and when I'm tempted to sort of shout, um, uh, I, I just get out my sketchbook and do a drawing instead. And as you see, this is volume four, so I started back in November. Uh, when I was at my most depressed about the political situation. Uh, I can't imagine why. but um, And I thought, I'm going to keep this sketchbook for five years, which is a parliamentary term. And little did I know back in November that the first few months would be as eventful as, as they've turned out to be. So volume, uh, volume four, I've only just begun. So this is, uh, this is the uh, 2nd of July. Uh, here is uh, One Country, One System. A uh, chance to draw a Chinese dragon. Um, the Chinese Communist Party, don't you love them? <laughs> and, uh, and this one was just the other day. This is coming out of lockdown. And uh, if we see there, there's a nice real ale. It's called Barnard Castle Liars Ale. Just in case you fancy <laughs> a, a drink. Um, and, and just today, uh, we have Boris very saying, I can't wait. Behave, behave responsibly. There we are. This is from the man who got Brexit done. He's asking us, us to behave responsibly, Nicolette. I think we are at the moment. <laughs> just, I love the bear with the club. That's wonderful, wonderful Brexit bear. One of my, uh, one of my favourite illustrations is the one you drew for Brexit with um, a, a family on a on a cliff waving goodbye to a, a, a sort of a beautiful castle of Europe in the distance. Oh yes, yes. Well, I, um, I think that was more a uh, rather than the castle of Europe. It, it was more a sort of I, I 
idea of this wonderful castle in the air that's going to be post-Brexit Britain, uh, where everything is going to be wonderful, you know, and and, and built on on really sort of secure, cumulus foundations, you know. So um, so we should should be all absolutely absolutely fine um, come uh, January because. Um, if you're in a, a wonderful sort of economic slump, there's nothing better than to promote a sort of, you know, uh, opening up of the economy uh, than um, leaving the biggest, uh, biggest sort of one of the biggest uh, markets that you uh, you sell to. So we're, we're going to have a lovely time, I think, come, uh, come January. Um. Uh, I just I wondered, we were talking about some of your favourite illustrators earlier, uh, apart from Tenniel, you were talking about um, admiring Helen Oxenbury and Toby Hansen and so on. I wonder, are there any illustrators of Alice in Wonderland you've ever seen that you didn't like, where you thought they've got it wrong? Or is it one of those texts that means that everything works? Uh, I don't think you that... Know, kind of I, I think that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge and the joy. I think is, is that um, there isn't um, there isn't one way to see this this book. Um, Tenniel, I think, as the original illustrator, gave us the the the, the template, um, and and so sort of um, you know he his is is the sort of original vision and the one that I uh, it, I will always love. Um, but I think part of the the, the, the wonderful sort of enduring nature of, of both Wonderland and Looking Glass is that they're, um, they're this fantastic club and we can all sort of join it um, in our own ways and imagine them, imagine the characters in our own ways. And, and one of the sort of fantastic things to see is the community. I think it's called um, cosplay, um, Nicolette, and it's, it's when people dress up. In, in wonderful characters, often based on Wonderland characters, um, and uh, I remember sitting in a um, in a rather sort of smart hotel in um, in Seattle, and looking up and seeing the man the the, the Hatter the Mad March Hare, and Alice all having tea. Um, at a table opposite, um, and it was a thing apparently that cosplayers enjoy doing. It's going to, you know, sort of hotels that serve English tea, you know, sort of high tea, um, and enacting the um, the the tea party. Um, and there they were. It was wonderful. It was like being in the book. When I was asked to, sort of, would I illustrate um, uh, Alice in Wonderland? Um, I thought, my goodness. First, I was sort of absolutely terrified to, to sort of follow my uh, follow my illustration hero. And then there was this other sort of feeling, which was altogether cosier, which was this idea of joining joining a club. Um, and and I loved that idea of sort of you know joining the club that uh, uh, Carol and Tenniel founded. And becoming one of the sort of maybe less impressive members, you know, possibly you know the one that um, you know is a little bit new to everything and and, and not terrible, but uh, but <laughs> needless to say, being invited to join was 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 a lovely, lovely thing. So um, do, do so I do like love. It's a, it's, I mean, I'm I'm torn between thinking, you know, what took you so long? Because obviously, you were copying White Rabbit when you were very young and you were were a child. Um, but also wondering about whether it's uh, it's like actors playing Lear. You know, it's it's a sort of at some point in your career, and possibly at a rather grand and established point in your career, it's the challenge that you're going to have to face. Do you think uh, everybody, every great illustrator, has to do their Wonderland at some point? Um, yes, I, I, I think you're right, um, and uh, and it's I, I think it's more for me uh, my uh, my Hamlet, I think uh, my, my Hamlet, uh, where I'm actually sort of uh, illustr having the temerity to to illustrate uh, this this enduring classic, um, and I think um, like uh, like all these sort of roles, you know, one one risks. Falling off the stage uh, and falling flat on your on, on your face, and so so there is a little bit of sort of um, trepidation now that um, that Alice is actually uh, actually with me, but not yet out in the world. And so um, so what I'm sort of really looking forward to, in some senses, is is showing people my uh, my version 
of Alice. But at the same time, um, I'm a little bit sort of, you know, worried about the uh, the great community out there who who will be sort of outraged by my depiction of um, of a dark haired Alice or a or an inadvertently sort of um, uh, incorrect rabbit. Um, and so, uh, yes, it's going to be a really sort of interesting um, experience. I, to I think you're safe, it. Chris. I, I don't think there's going to be too much outrage. I think there will be nothing but delight about this. Um, well, I wonder if the experience of illustrating the text made you feel differently about it. I mean, it may be that your pictures make other people feel differently about it because you've introduced new ideas through the pictures. Um, but once you'd read it again closely to think about how you were going to illustrate it, did you notice things in it that you hadn't noticed before? Did you feel differently about uh, the characters that you had originally seen through Tenniel's eyes and now you reimagined through your own? Um, is, it, yes. is it a different book to you now? Um, yes, it is, because it, it, it's a, a book I remembered from my childhood. And then going back to, to sort of reimagine it, um, it's, uh, it's justifiably a sort of surreal sort of um, a, a sort of a surrealist dream in a way because of this wonderful sense of the changing scales of everything um, and uh, and to sort of discover the the, the sort of different uh, different sort of ways in which Alice sort of negotiates her way through Wonderland um, you know growing and shrinking and um, you know sort of uh, changing her perspective on, on, on who she sees and how she gets around uh, was absolutely sort of mind-blowing for me personally. Um, and, uh, and there's a sort of sense in which, um, you know, it, it, Wonderland itself is, is, is a story of, of sort of, um, of portals, of, of moving from one, one place to another, you know, through doors. And there's a wonderful sort of scene very early on where um, uh, down the rabbit hole there is a long corridor and Alice sort of turns up at this corridor and just sees all these doors. Um, to, uh, and I've often sort of wondered, um, you know, every door has got the potential to open up into um, an, a world or different worlds, every bit as sort of remarkable and unique as Wonderland itself. And uh, and I, I love that sort of uh, that notion of of books as doors, um, and I think the, the there's a possibility the Tenniel sort of uh, in in Tenniel's wonderful sort of rabbit hole, it contains many many portals to different places and different worlds, and we go through one of them and find ourselves in Wonderland, and I think all of us who work in children's books in a sense are continually opening doors and going through them into into new worlds and discovering new realities, uh, which is the joy, I think, of reading. Um, and so I think sort of Tenniel and, and uh, Carol collaborated in this extraordinary sort of piece of work that gave us the modern children's book. And so from that point of view, I mean, I went back to the origin of everything. So as an illustrator who's worked for many years, illustrating all sorts of books, going back to Wonderland was like going back to the primary source. Um, yeah, where so it's, it all, a, it's, yeah. a, it's full of possibilities, as all the doors are. It's a story about stories and potential and so on. Which, and as you say, a surrealist dream. It's not surprising that Salvador Dali was among the artists who illustrated it uh, himself. Uh, we were talking a bit earlier about um, uh, different kinds of illustrators and and joining the club. Um, one of the one of the things that has happened over the years is that it, uh, that exhibition at the British Library. Uh, showed us was that there are sort of fashions in illustrating Alice and that sometimes it's been uh, interpreted as a more sinister and strange and surreal story and sometimes as something very cute so that for instance we got Mabel Lucy Atwell illustrating Alice with a very cosy little rabbit and it I get, uh, it went through a phase of, of um, Alice being sort of doll-like and the and the creatures being cuddly toys and so on. Um, do you, somewhere in all of that, where do you feel that uh, Alice really belongs? Is it on the strange, surreal side? Is it, or, or is it, uh, is it a cosy story? Can it even be ever properly interpreted as a cosy story? Um, I, I think both. Um, uh, I, I think it is um, what it is. 
uh, principally, and I think this is why it's become archetypal. Um, it is the, it's a story told by an adult to amuse children on a picnic. Um, and so, you know, you get that real sense of, of um, uh, Lewis Carroll, um, Charles Dodson, um, making it up as he goes along to entertain these, these three children on a picnic. Um, and um, I think um, Alice, that could be a character. Um, um, and I think there is this sort of um, sense in which, you know, it, it is strange and wonderful and, and, and sort of full of, of sort of uh, incident and things going on. And yet it is this sort of rambling um, sort of uh, tales sort of told out loud. And I think that comes across. the. And so for many, yeah, the most sort of successful books I've always found are, are the ones that feel as if they have been told first. You know, they, they're, or, or even sort of read aloud. Um, you need to hear a story, I think, out loud uh, for children to just sort of yeah. gauge their response and how they how it works. And um, I think uh, Lewis Carroll sort of invented, in some sense, that way of doing things. You know, it's it's which is why I wanted to depict the real children uh, who who must have sat and listened and been enchanted by the stories that he told on, on the picnics and asked him to put them in a book. Um, which uh, which he did. Can you imagine if he ne he just not got round to it, like many of us? You know, it just sort of, it was something he would do, and then he never really got round to it. So again, I think he's a great example of actually acting on that. If you've got a wonderful story in your head and, and you've told it to delighted children, write it down um, and make it real, just just as uh, Dodson did. Um, that's a very good bit of advice to would-be writers. What about would-be illustrators? If somebody has seen your illustrations and is inspired by them and thinks, so oh, this is what I would like to be able to do, uh, what would you say to them? Uh, how do you be become an illustrator like you? I know one of your own children, uh, Katie Riddell, is herself an illustrator. What did you say to her? Um, how do you encourage a young person to become an illustrator? Um, uh, well, Katie, I think, is a case in point. Um, you know, um, I think the last thing she wanted to do was the, uh, the same, um, same thing that her father did. So, so she spent a lot of her time trying to sort of avoid it. But in fact, she was a born illustrator. Um, and so she just sort of, you know, there was no way she, she wasn't going to be an illustrator. Um, uh, and so she finally accepted her fate. Uh, and, and became and made me immensely proud. Um, but uh, I think if I had personally, as her dad, encouraged her in any way, um, that would have been an end of it. Um, so I'm much better encouraging people who aren't directly related to me. Um, uh, and uh, I think there is this idea. I think for illustrators as well, of, of sort of inspiration. You know, what 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 am I going to sort of draw? How do I sort of find a style? And I always say, just just draw maybe whatever's in front of you um sort of, uh, you know just just there's always something to draw um uh you can um very 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 well catalogued <laughs> bookshelf i feel there's a there's a librarian <laughs> lurking in, 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 in your I've never yes. seen more order charts from here Nicola I can actually I think I can discern a sort of alphabet uh, sort of system where you actually catalogue them <laughs> you all. Know, I'm sure. You know I told you that I alphabetize, alphabetize <laughs> my books in lockdown. <laughs> I love this um, image. It's yeah. wonderful. I have one last picture to add. This could be the last, but I but I thought we might just squeeze in one uh, tiny picture more, which is um, because it's Alice Day, but it is also uh, Independence Day. I thought for any American friends who are watching, perhaps we could do uh, the Mad Hatter in an Uncle Sam hat. Just so we have something of uh, celebrating uh, the US at the same time as we celebrate uh, this great book and this great illustrator and indeed your new book, which has... You know, well, as... You, we've seen a lot of it, but this looks absolutely marvellous. <laughs> uh, as a, um, uh, a cartoonist, I've drawn Uncle Sam so many times um and 
and Uncle Sam, I think, is is one of these sort of characters that that are so useful to cartoonists because if you want to embody, you know, the spirit of a a nation or whatever, it's it's handy to have a nice sort of uh, figure you can sort of draw easily. Um, I've been drawing Britannia and her lion quite often, just to you know, often in lockdown, wearing masks and things. Um, and so, uh, so I think on this Fourth of July we have a hatter, and I think instead of Uncle Sam, I think we we should have Aunt Sam. Aunt Perfect. Sam. We go <laughs> on the of July. Perfect. Well, happy Independence Day and happy Alice Day. And I love the fact that you talked about the way Lewis Carroll makes it up as it goes along. When you make it up as you go along, what a miraculous sight it is. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful to watch. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to hear you and to see this. And um, you can pre-order, apparently, uh, Alice in Wonderland, although it's not out till October. Um, so do rush away and do so. And enjoy the rest of your day and have a lovely cup of tea. Thank you. Nicolette, that was lovely. <laughs>